وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As always, we begin with the praise of Allah and by asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions. We're continuing with our discussion on Birr al-Walidayn and this time we've moved on to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're going to start with the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiyallahu an annahu qal جاء رجل إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله من أحق الناس بحسن صحابتي in a narration بحسن الصحبة قال أمك قال ثم من قال أمك قال ثم من قال أمك قال ثم من قال أبوك متفق عليه and in another narration أدناك ثم أدناك أدناك. A man came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he said, "O Messenger of Allah, who is the most deserving of the people of the, my excellent companionship? Uh, Sahabati here it means suhbati, my excellent companionship." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Your mother." The man said, "Then who?" The Prophet ﷺ replied, Your mother. The man said, Then who? The Prophet ﷺ said, Your mother. The man said, Then who? The Prophet ﷺ said, Your father. And in another narration, he said, Thumma adnaka adnak. Then the closest one to you and the closest one to you. By order of how close they are. This hadith is a fundamental hadith as it relates to Birr al Walidain. And it relates to husn suhba excellence in companionship. And that's why here, if you look at the speech of the scholars here, they don't extract from this that your mother has three times more right to obedience than your father. And we talk about obedience later on. Obedience, there's a matter of difference among the scholars. Some of them took this hadith to relate to obedience as well. Some of them didn't. But generally speaking, it's not the topic of the hadith isn't one of obedience. It's one of excellence in companionship. The way you behave around them and who is the most deserving of the people for you to strive to the, for that ihsan in the way that you deal with them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, your mother. And that's the first answer. And then three times in total he answered your mother. Meaning that the mother has three times more right to excellence in companionship than the father. Now the question would be, what would make this the case? Because uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says generally in the Quran, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانَ Be good to both of your parents. And there isn't really that distinction between the mother and the father until we come to this hadith. So what makes the mother three times more deserving? The ulama, they say it is what the mother, she has the unique things that she suffered for the sake of her child. So first of all, the pregnancy, and then the labor and the birth, and then the uh, the feeding and looking after of the child when they're very small. Uh, these are the things, Some and there's a variation. Some of them said the labor and the birth and so on. But generally speaking, it's these things that only the mother can do. Only the mother will carry that child for nine months. Only the mother will have the pains of labor and childbirth. And that's uh, why, or that's why some of the scholars, they put that forward to say that is why the mother is three times more deserving of excellence, ihsan, in the way that you treat her and the way you are around her. And again, husn al-suhba is the way we see the word suhba being used uh, as it relates to uh, the relationship with the parents. In Surah Luqman, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Accompany them in the dunya. So there is a suhbah. There is a kind of companionship 
between the child and the parent. Accompany them in this dunya in the best way. There's a kind of companionship. Uh, there's a kind of companionship there. And again, it deals with all of the different aspects. So it can deal with how you speak to them, how you behave towards them. And if it's the case that the father is deserving of ihsan, because Allah said, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا To both of your parents, treat them with ihsan. And Allah Azza wa Jalla said, إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا If one of them reaches old age, or both of them, either father or the mother, and yet the mother is deserving three times more than the father. Three times more than the father. Then what does that say about the way that you should treat your mother? If the father is the one who is deserving of And the father is the one If one of them reaches old age or both of them Then don't say uff and don't repel them or push them away and don't and, and say to them say to them the best and the most noble of words if that's the father's right and the mother has three times that right then what is the right of the mother how can we find the words to express the right of the mother in islam then each person according to how close they are so here someone might say well what do we say about the siblings what do we have to say about other relatives, the uncles and the cousins? Then the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Then the one who is the closest to you and then the next one who is closest to you. And Islam didn't just give importance to being good to your parents. There is also a huge threat of punishment and a severe warning for those who are not good to their parents. Abu Hurairah narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam annahu qala raghima anfu thumma raghima anfu thumma raghima anfu man adraka abawayhi 'inda al-kibara ahaduhuma aw kilahuma falam yadkhul al-jannah rawahu muslim abi hurairah narrates from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he said raghima anf raghima anf it is for the nose of a person to be rubbed into dust, for their nose to be uh, to be covered or to be rubbed into dust, and this is an expression of a dis of disgrace of hawan uh, and zilla that a person is disgraced and the person is lowered down, and the word here is not necessarily the the nose here isn't just referring to the nose. But it's a, it's the the normal phrase of Arabic is to use one part to refer to the whole, uh, and the nose is uh, is used in this expression raghima anf that may his nose be rubbed into the dust, and here it is the the apparent wording is the Prophet Sallallahu is making du'a against this person three times may his face be rubbed in the dust may his nose be rubbed in the dust may his nose be rubbed in the dust. I may he be disgraced, may he be disgraced, may he be disgraced. The one who finds his parents at old at, at old age, one of them or both of them, and then that person doesn't enter Jannah. I they don't take advantage of the opportunity to enter Jannah through uh, being good to their parents and looking after them when they're old. And a person is prevented from Jannah and doesn't go to Jannah despite having one of their parents or both of their parents uh, reach old age, this is an indication that that person is aq liwalidei, is a disobedient person towards their parents because they didn't enter Jannah even though they had this huge bab min abu abil Jannah, this huge gate from the gates of paradise. And there are narrations which indicate that it is the middle of the gates of paradise, that the parents are a huge uh, is, are a huge gate from the gates of paradise for a person to enter into. And if a person has a parent, reaches old age, and then they don't enter Jannah, what does that say about the way that they behave towards their parents? And this is not the only hadith which contains a severe warning uh, against uh, disobeying the parents or against making the parents unhappy. And we're going to come to more of those later on. We'll come now to a hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-Asr radiallahu anhumah. That he said, Aqbala Rajulun 
إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال أبايعك على الهجرة والجهاد أبتغي الأجر من الله قال فهل من والديك أحد حي This man he came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he said I would like to pledge my allegiance to you that I will perform hijra and jihad and I want the reward from Allah The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Are any of your two parents still alive? Are any of your parents still alive? قال نعم بل كلاهما He said yes rather both of them are still alive The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said فتبتغي الأجر من الله Is it that you want the reward from Allah? قال نعم He said yes The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said فارجع إلى والديك فأحسن صحبتهما In another wording ففيهما فجاهد The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Are one of your parents Are your parents alive? One of your parents alive? Any of them? He said yes both of them The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Is it that you want the reward from Allah? The man said yes The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Go back to your parents And be, have good companionship with them And in suhba like we talked about فأحسن suhbatahuma Have excellence in the way that you behave towards them In another narration, فَفِيهِمَا فَجَاهِدْ Go and make jihad for them. I.e. go and strive to attain their pleasure. Strive not to upset them and work hard. And from this, there are two benefits that we want to take out or three. The first thing that we want to take out is the importance of بِرْ الْوَالِدَيْنِ as we had mentioned earlier. In the sense that the Prophet ﷺ preferred it over al-jihad wal-hijrah. He preferred it over the jihad and he preferred it over the hijrah. The second point that we want to take is the Prophet ﷺ didn't ask if the parents are Muslim or non-Muslim. He didn't say, are any of your parents alive? Then he didn't say, are they, is that parent Muslim? Am kafir. Are they Muslim or are they? Muslimani am kafirani. Are they two Muslims or two kafir? Well, he didn't ask that question, the Prophet ﷺ. He said if you want the reward from Allah go back and be good to them and as we said in his statement فَفِيهِمَا فَجَاهِدْ there is a dalil and this is wallah a point that if I believe if this was the only point we mentioned in this episode it would be sufficient to be of a benefit inshallah ta'ala and that is that looking after your parents and being good to them is a jihad it is a jihad it's tough and remember the word jihad In its asl, in its original meaning, it means to strive and to give the utmost effort. And it's used in that meaning sometimes. Uh, for example, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "Wajahidhum bihi jihadan kabira," and make jihad against them with the Quran, a great jihad. But the point here is that in this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described. So looking after your parents as jihad. فَفِيهِمَا فَجَاهِدْ Go back and make jihad with those two parents. And that, subhanAllah, shows you how difficult it can be. It's not an easy ride. Some people think that, subhanAllah, like for example, some people look at uh, the, the Salaf al-Salih and we're going to talk about how they were in Birr al-Walidayn, inshallah, in a subsequent episode. And they, they say that, Well, you know, like, you know, their parents were probably really good and, you know, they don't have to deal with what we... The, ultimately, dealing with your parents is hard. And doing Birr al-Walidayn is hard. And preferring your parents over the things you want. This man came, he wanted to go and make jihad. He wanted to go for that. He wanted to make hijrah. And yet the Prophet ﷺ said, فَفِيهِمَا فَجَاهِدْ Go back and make jihad. Go back and make jihad with those two parents of yours. So it's not an easy matter. It requires determination and hard work. To prefer them over your preferences is not an easy thing. It's not easy at all. To give them preference over you, to give them preference over your family members, and again, without you know, excluding the rights of others, but to give them preference over you uh, is not an easy thing for a person to do, especially in our time. We know that we are living in a time of Urquq al-Walidi. And the Prophet ﷺ said that from the signs of the hour, and تَلِدَ الْأَمَةُ رَبَّتَهَا That the 
in the hadith of Jibril in Sahih Muslim that the slave girl will give birth to her mistress. One of the strongest opinions in the explanation of this uh, statement and talid al amatu rabbataha is that it means that the the mother gives birth to a daughter who treats her mother like a slave. And that it refers to al-uquq, uquq al-walidayn, being bad to your parents. And we're living in that time. We're living in that time. Maybe the time will get worse, Allahu alam. But we're living in a time where it is aqalul qalil. It's from the very rare things that you see somebody who does birr al-walidayn. In the sense that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi described it. It's not an easy thing for a person to do. It requires great, great difficulty for you to really fulfill Birr al Walidain. And that's why, you know, that the, uh, the, the thing that Allah Azza wa Jal is selling to you is Jannah and it's expensive. Jannah is not an easy thing to get, that you just get the most valuable thing. The most the 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 thing that Allah has sent you is ghalia. It's valuable, and it's valuable and it means it's not cheap. It doesn't come cheaply. And if the parents are one of the major gates into the from the gates of paradise, then ultimately you have to realize that it requires some work to get to that level. We know that the Prophet ﷺ said that no one who is disobedient to their parents will enter Jannah. No one who is disobedient to their parents will enter Jannah. And we know that al-uquq, as we talked about in the first episode when we did the definition, is the opposite of al-birr. So anyone who falls short in their birr towards their parents, in their ihsan towards their parents, this is aq, this is a person who is disobedient to their parents. And the Prophet ﷺ said they will not enter Jannah. I.e. they will not enter Jannah with the people who enter it duhulan awaliyan, and they enter into it in the first instance. Rather, they will receive a punishment that will that will prevent them from entering Jannah with the, the people who enter Jannah immediately. And as for them remaining in the fire forever, then no Muslim who is a person of Tawheed and who brings the minimum requirements to remain a Muslim, they will not uh, remain in the fire forever. So when the Prophet said that they will not enter Jannah, it doesn't mean they will never, ever, ever enter Jannah. Abad al-Abad, but what it means is that they will not enter Jannah when the people enter Jannah and they will be held back in punishment. Uh, we seek Allah's refuge from that because they were bad to their parents. And a person might ask, well, what about the disbeliever? How do we, what about if our parents are not a Muslim? And we know that Allah told us in, in, uh, in Surah Luqman, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ and if they compel you to make a partner with me in that which you have no knowledge of, do not obey them and accompany them. Have, have companionship with them in a good way. And this is further explained in the hadith of Asma bint Abi Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhuma. Annaha qalat qadimat alayya ummi wa hiya mushrika. She said, my mother came to me, she came, you know, she came to, to visit me, and she was a mushrika. She was a, an idol worshipper. During the time of the Prophet. She said, I asked the Prophet, what should I do? And my mother has come to me. And she is raghiba. In some of the narrations, it mentions raghima, and she's she's uh, obstinate against uh, against becoming Muslim. But raghiba, this is the majority of the narrations, and Allah knows best that she desires from me something. She wants something from me. Any in other words, she wants a sila. She wants a good companionship. She wants me to, you know, do the things that a daughter should do for her mother. She wants me to look after her, take care of her. Or she wants me to give her or to spend on her. She wants me to speak nicely to her. And it's narrated in this that Asma kept her mother waiting. She didn't let her mother come in out of a fear that she would be from those people who uh, made, 
who had a companionship with the non-Muslims. That's what she was so scared that she didn't want to be from the people uh, that showed uh, close allegiance uh, to the uh, to the non-Muslims and the ayat which came regarding that. So she kept her mother. She didn't she didn't accept her mother's wish for her mother to you know to to, to for her to to sort of behave with her like a daughter to a mother until she went to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam she said my mother has come and she's raghiba and she is she wants me to she's not a muslim she's mushrika she's a polytheist and she wants me to look after her or she wants me to keep ties with her afa asilu ummi should i keep ties with my mother qala na'am sili ummak the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said yes Keep the ties with your mother. He said, yes, keep the ties with your mother. And subhanAllah, that was in a situation where her mother was, in some of the narrations, it mentions that her mother was firm upon her shirk, upon making a partner with Allah Azza wa Jal, was stern upon it, but still wanted the rights of a mother. And she says, should I give my mother those rights? Should I look after, should I keep the ties with my mother? Afa'asilu ummi? Qala na'am. Sili ummak He said, yes, keep those ties with, with your mother. Now someone might ask the question about Asma being the sister of Aisha radiallahu anha. How did, how did that work? Uh, because Asma, she went to Aisha and she told Aisha to ask the Prophet وسلم, to, about the question. Or she, uh, she asked Aisha uh, to, uh, to find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so she could ask the question. Here we have to understand that Asma, she was the half-sister of Aisha. The mother was different, but the father was the same. Asma, her father was Abu Bakr, and Aisha, her father was Abu Bakr. But the two mothers were different. They were half-sisters, and that's why this hadith uh, here, that her mother came when she was, when she was mushrika, the mother of Aisha, accepted uh, Islam uh, before that radiallahu ta'ala anha wa ardaha wa radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So the next topic that we have to deal with is the topic of obedience to the parent. And this is quite a big topic and it has many different aspects to it. So I'm going to actually stop the, the, the episode here, inshallah ta'ala. We'll resume next time where we'll talk about uh, ta'at al-walidayn. And we talked about the fact that the word bir in linguistically refers to a ta'a, refers to obedience. So there's no doubt obedience to the parents is a major, major part of bir al-walidayn. But here we need to understand where are the limits and what happens when they ask us to do things that, for example, might be harmful to us or things that might be haram or things that might not be haram but might be difficult for us to do. Where are the limits and where do we draw the line and where do we understand the guidance of Islam as it relates to ob obedience to our parents? That's coming up in the next episode. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Wassalatu wassalam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.